The autonomous self-driving network has been cited as an end goal for telcos for a few years already. But what progress has been made on introducing intelligent AI-driven automation into today's communications infrastructure? And what do telcos need to do to accelerate their efforts in this sphere? Well, to find out more, I'm talking today with Grant Lenahan, partner and principal analyst at Apple Door Research. Grant, thanks very much for joining us today. Good to see you again. Uh, what progress has been made on implementing intelligent automation in telco networks? You know, it's, it's an interesting question, Ray, because it's a huge journey. Um, it's always very tempting as we're struggling to move forward to lament the progress we haven't made. But I think the industry has actually made quite a bit of progress. And we're beginning to see a lot of the bricks laid that are well up from the foundation in automation. Um, we've seen the false start of uh, virtual network uh, functions that were in fat VMs, and now we're well along the way to cloudified network functions and network systems. And then there are hidden pieces of automation that I think don't get as much attention that are actually changing norms and changing expectations and helping companies trust automation, which is a huge, huge challenge, particularly when you're held to the high availability and reliability standards that our industry uh, is. And let me throw out a couple of examples of those. One is SD-WAN. And I think SD-WAN achieved a high level of automation, partly because there was no alternative. You either implemented it as delivered by a vendor or you didn't. Uh, another area is we're seeing a lot of automation in SDN. Uh, in, and what we're really seeing is the underlying technology of routers, et cetera, is making it possible to have a lot more autonomous real-time control and then reorganization. And this is just leading to a lot of efficiencies, not just in turning up services, but in the utilization of the network and therefore uh, improving the capital utilization of our uh, our clients. Yeah, I mean, it's clear that there really has been a lot of change. If you look back three or four years to where we are now, uh, there's been a, a lot of advances. And of course, many people have said that really the, the communication network would have struggled to get through the COVID-19 pandemic period um, and and met all user needs uh, if that greater softwareization and automation hadn't been there. Uh, but what would you say has been the, the key progress in terms of um, operating and running autonomous processes within the telecom operators? So let, let's separate two kinds of automation. The first kind of automation is automation that, for example, fairly sequentially sets up a service. The second kind of automation gets much more at this autonomous or self-driving uh, concept. And that is a life cycle where a control loop is in place. And uh, I've actually worked with control loops in, in various industries over my career, which is interesting. And the idea is that you set something up, you have an intent, right? A goal for how it should operate. You set it up, but then you're constantly monitoring the performance. Is it continuing to operate in the state that I want it in? And one of the great things is we're finally seeing network engineers who have learned for decades and decades that the more control and the more specificity they, they use, the better their results. Getting comfortable saying, sometimes I need to back off. I need to set higher level abstract goals for the network and I need to let the machines do their thing. And the reason I want to do that is it gives it a lot more flexibility to seek not only the best solution for service A, but for service B. And now what you really have is a life cycle process going on. And, and I think when we think about autonomous, that's really what we're talking about. At, in the move to cloudification of network functions, it's that autonomy that has become very important. And you mentioned something right at the beginning. Uh, you talked about AI driven and machine learning driven. When you start implementing machine learning, you're also getting to autonomous because you're letting the system learn. You're letting it identify things that are good and things that are bad. 
and actually changing future behavior of quote OSS based on what you learn. And that's that's a wonderful objective. Yeah, and it's been talked about for years, but we're, we're really starting to see the the early stages of this now, uh, especially yeah. I think around, you know, some of the uh, much needed energy efficiency initiatives that we're seeing uh, in some radio access networks in particular. Um, now, what impact does this all have on the skills and teams and future requirements of, of staffing at the network operators? You know, you said skills and teams, and they're highly related, and yet they're also different. Um, when you implement automation, you typically have to change the business process. Uh, there was a story decades ago about Hewlett Packard wanting to get the cost down on their, their award-winning calculators and deciding they needed automation. Then they realized they needed to redesign the calculator for machine assembly. And when they were done redesigning it, it was so much simpler that they didn't really need the automation. And, you know, the, it's, it's a, a tangential story, but it, it talks about the importance of rethinking, not just that you add software or robots to do something, but that you rethink how it's done. And there are two huge changes. The first is to the skill sets, like you talked about. And now people need to be comfortable with a level of abstraction and a lack of direct control. And in many cases, I think people's skill sets move from doing things to designing processes, systems, and software that do things in, frankly, a more repeatable, higher volume and cheaper way. But then you talked about um, organizations and teams. And that also is a problem because we have typically organized a lot of our operations around software processes that were you know, very linear. So you had a fulfillment team and you had a capacity activation and management team, and you had a service assurance team, and they truly were separate. Uh, we also tended to have different teams for things like IP and optical. As we get into automation and we get into life cycles where the very same software that sets up a service or a network element also heals it, you know, monitors it and, he and heals it, and then deals with capacity expansion, which we now call scaling. Uh, and when we deal with automated processes for uh, VPNs that require not only how do you set up the IP, but what path does it run on, on the, on the glass underneath, we need to break down these silos that we've built for very good reasons. And you got to remember these silos often represent people's careers and, and people are invested in them and very, very proud of what they've accomplished. So, so it, it does become disruptive. And if you try and bring in the automation without changing the, the structure of an organization and how people believe they are rewarded, um, it's probably not going to be that smooth. And yet there's tremendous opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what everybody's looking for now in the industry are examples of, of where things have, have gone well. And also, of course, everybody wants to know where mistakes have been made as well to learn from that. So um, do we know what lessons telcos have learned from their early network automation efforts? I don't know that I know all the lessons they've learned, but what we can point to is the fact that they have learned. You know, we put in fat VMs with images and realized this wasn't giving us the speed, the flexibility, uh, it wasn't taking advantage of the learnings that came out of the public cloud se sector and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and all of those, and we saw the industry press restart. So the good news is we are learning. Um, I think the industry is also, and you just said this, Ray, I think they're, they're looking at, let me put some automation in place, but monitor it very carefully, put it in, in small scale, see the results, and get comfortable that I'm not turning loose automation that's gonna do something perfectly and repeatedly wrong a million times, right? And they're beginning to realize that these things can work and, and building generic uh, orchestration engines that, that can implement intent with some degree of confidence. So I think that's a good step forward. I, I also think, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that they almost had to get comfortable with automation through things like SD-WAN and SDN is, is another confidence booster where I'm not sure that 
companies have learned quite how to handle things is in some of those areas that we just talked about where people and organizations or processes are concerned because these aren't necessarily technical learnings, um, but these require how do you communicate to people? How do you make people understand that while their job's changing, um, they're still valued and they still have skills that are valued by the organization? Um, people don't like change. And this is really, really deep, radical change. Uh, so uh, I certainly can't blame anyone for not having that 100% figured out. Um, but I do believe it's going to take several years for that to be fully worked through. Yeah, we're, we're really still at the uh, early stages of, of what is, a, like you said, it's a, it's a monumental change for this industry. Um, so what would you say, uh, finally, are, are the major challenges uh, that still need to be overcome to, to move this forward, to, to bring some of this uh, automation and the benefits of automation uh, into the telecom sector? Boy, I'd, I'd really be something if I could pick the exact things we needed to do. Well, let me think, let me take a slightly different tact on that and say that I think we need to recognize that there are a lot of forms of automation and that when we finish one, the job isn't done. We've just moved another piece of the puzzle. When you think of automation, there's almost a, a flow from the lowest level up to the top. And we're only moving along that, that path step by step. First, you have to automatically configure, deploy the infrastructure, and then you need to configure those network elements. And then you need to automatically configure network services on top of those network elements, and then customer services on top of those. Then you need to make sure that you're monitoring and identifying the critical areas to automatically assure and heal those services and those underlying networks. Then you need to do the same for capacity expansion and ultimately that area of learning, um, which is going to be, I believe, driven by machine learning in the not too distant future. So I think step number one is recognizing that there is always more to do. The job is never done. And we shouldn't say, well, let's budget for the next two years and then we'll have the have a complete automated system. It is going to be a continuing process probably for a decade. Yeah. actually probably for many decades, um, but it will continue to make us more cost effective, more advanced, more flexible, hopefully more profitable. I think the second piece, if we really identify what we need to learn how to use, is that piece of ML and AI. And we need to get beyond taking some of the really smart, experienced network experts and, and codifying their knowledge to being, being at the place where we're codifying the ability to learn and to say, these are bad combinations in the network. These are good combinations. These data points are bad signs. These data points are good signs. And use that to constantly improve without programmers having to scratch their head and write a lot of code from scratch, hoping that they made it better. This way we have data saying it will be better. Yeah, that that would be a massive advance, and I guess that's why, you know, these days there's so much more talk uh, in the industry about uh, collaboration and, and learning from each other because nobody can figure this out by themselves, and and really there would be no great advantage to to anybody actually doing that either. So, um, Grant, great insights. It, it's been great to talk to you today. Thanks very much for for joining us, and and look forward to getting your thoughts again in the near future. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ray.